Welcome to the Second Drafts Podcast, everything you need to write, edit, and publish your way. I'm Jeremy. And I'm EJ. And today on Second Drafts, we'll be talking about covers. Hmm. So, I'm sure that everyone does it there. It's a bad habit, and but it is kind of inevitable. We do judge books by their covers. <laughs> In more ways than one, of course, but yeah. uh, literally as well. Uh, and it's probably just because of the way that, uh, you know, we've kind of uh, evolved as humans, as it were. Uh, we're visual creatures, so uh, it's only natural that when we look at a cover, that's going to be the first thing that's going to catch our eye. And mm. it's going to make us investigate further. So before we look at the title, even before we look at the description, or the reviews or anything like that. It's the cover. Mm. That's kind of that first representation of uh, the book that we get. Mm. And have... Oh, you were going to say something? Oh, no. I was just about to add, you know, it's... it's we. I think we need that filter. If you think how many books are being published, it's hundreds of thousands every year that's joining the market now. Yeah. Right? We need somehow. We can't inspect every single one and all its reviews and stuff we just need that first level of a filter to kind of make us focus on some of those books to the exclusion of others and i think yeah that's your first filter is does the cover mm -hmm. grab you yeah for sure <laughs> having an intriguing cover can uh, mean the difference between somebody actually picking up your book or clicking on the link or uh, passing you by for something else that looks just that little bit mm -hmm. better even yeah, definitely. But uh, I've come across a strange thing that happens sometimes in the, the the indie publishing sphere, at least. And it's, uh, you know, people who self-publish, um, often they think but to themselves, well, you know, they've gotten a manuscript edited to perfection, they've got a killer title, they've got a whole media kit set, you know, put together for publicizing the book. So they reckon it'll be fine, you know. Why do they necessarily need a great cover? And, I mean, I get this for indie publishers or indie authors, especially the budgets can be very tight sometimes. You mm -hmm. know, I mean, you have to choose sometimes. You have to balance the, the requirements. And sometimes in that uh, balancing act, the cover is the thing that gets short shrift. Yeah. And, um, yeah, I, I've spoken to people about this before, and their thinking usually goes that, you know, once their sales have picked up and they've made some money back on the book, then they'll put some of the proceeds back into the book to get a better cover. And um, I must say, I find that a very strange <laughs> uh, <laughs> way to go about it. Um, I would almost think by myself, rather do the cover first before you do anything else. And, mm. you know, if you have to choose between the two... <clears throat> Because, um, you know, without without a fantastic cover, I, I think it's quite unlikely that you're going to be getting those sales that you're going to be counting on. Yeah. I don't think I uh, have mentioned it yet there, but mm -hmm. uh, I kind of fell into that same boat uh, oh, when, <laughs> yeah, when, <laughs> when I was looking for getting a cover done there. The person who uh, does my covers, I, I was definitely satisfied with cover that I got but it was uh he was offering it for free to oh, yeah. build up his uh portfolio and so that's what I took there to uh, get my cover uh my first one it's uh different mm -hmm. from the one uh, that I have now and I'll explain a little bit more on that in a bit on why but mm -hmm. uh yeah I kind of fell into that same situation I focused more on editing and that sort of thing uh, over the cover. Okay, but but can I ask, was your first cover the one that had like kind of the brown map in the background? That's the one e you're talking about. Yeah, it was kind of the old style paper ah, looking one. But see, the difference with this is you may have gone, you know, cheap in the sense that you didn't pay a lot, but the cover was not at all bad. I can tell <laughs> you this up front, really, it wasn't. It was a very good cover, in fact. Yeah. Um, I'm, I, yeah I definitely I was more liked aiming it. At, Oh, sorry. What were you saying? <laughs> oh, yeah, no, I was talking more about people that go even, you know, with even less effort than that. Like I said, your cover, <laughs> nothing was wrong with it. 
but you get people that go with even you know a cover that looks like it was put together in Microsoft Paint. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> which you know there, <laughs> there's there's skimping a little and then there's skimping a lot. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I think like the biggest thing is uh, probably just uh, kind of what do you do when you're looking for a good cover and how do you uh, how do you get that? There's different definitely lots of different sites that you can go to. You can just do a quick Google search and find a lot of different um, people who would be able to do a cover for you. But mm. knowing what uh, what you should even put in a cover uh, for yourself is good knowledge, so that you can give that to the uh, to the person who's going to be making it for you. Mm. And uh, recently on Facebook, uh, on a author group that I'm part of, uh, a article from CreativeIndie.com was shared. It's a rather old cover. Uh, old article rather, but it's mm -hmm. uh, called Eight Cover Designs, uh, Eight Cover Design Secrets Publishers Use to Manipulate Readers into Buying Books. Oh, sounds interesting. Yeah, a little bit of a handful there, but <laughs> <laughs> uh, definitely uh, caught my eye there. So I looked it over and we'll just maybe uh, go over some of those tips and kind of see what we think about them. Mm, sure. So the uh, first one on the site is uh, to make it pop. And uh, basically what that would mean is having contrasting colors and a main image. Uh, it doesn't necessarily need to be in the middle. Uh, personally, I like it more in the middle there. But uh, mm -hmm. just somewhere so that it kind of draws the eyes towards what you want uh, it to be looking at. And then after that, it kind of just filters through and you can see everything else, but it just really grabs your attention. Hmm, and that's definitely sensible advice. Yeah. I think for yeah. the, for the contrasting colors, they usually use like a color wheel and then you take colors on the opposite sides. I think something like that. Yeah. That's why you get all these movie posters that are teal and orange together, like on the Transformers posters and stuff. I think that's, yeah, yeah movie posters use the same thing. Or yeah, if you uh, speaking of movie posters, there like say you look at the new uh, Star Wars poster, uh, mm -hmm. it's got like that black background with kind of like uh, space, so there's stars kind of in the background there, and then uh, they have all of the different characters up front, so all their faces and stuff mm -hmm. like that. So that's really contrasting with that black background. So. It brings your eyes into the characters, which is the focal point. And then if you start mm -hmm. looking around, you kind of see those background images of the stars. And uh, I'm not sure if it was a Death Star, and I can't remember exactly, but uh, just kind of see those different things on the periphery afterwards. Yeah, yeah I see. To make and I noticed the coloring, <laughs> the coloring of the two main uh, lightsabers are blue and orange. So that's kind of a color wheel contrast they're doing there. Yeah. It's pretty cool. Yeah. So yeah, just basically to kind of make you make you look at it first and then you kind of examine everything else. And that's mm -hmm. almost the ideal uh situation where they would be drawn in and then they would start to look at everything else like your name and the title and stuff like that. So mm -hmm. really draws it in by making that uh contrasting color and making it pop. So definitely a definitely a good one there. I feel I feel that that was uh, good advice. So <laughs> so the uh, second one there, uh, this I feel kind of it applies to certain styles. Uh, they say lots of space, so not cluttering the cover with too many images or text. Uh, and uh, one cover which. Uh, it kind of does this, but at the same time doesn't, uh, is one by uh, Stephen Erickson from his book, uh, Gardens of the Moon. Oh, yeah? And I think there's a new cover on it now, but yeah, the original... I think it's purple now. Yeah. The new cover. The, but... <laughs> the original cover I liked quite a bit. Uh, basically, it's just this uh, guy standing on a cliff 
in front of what looks like a castle town. And he's holding up a sword, and there's, like, lightning kind of arcing from it. And oh. if it was zoomed in a lot more, it would be cluttered. But yeah. where it's kind of zoomed out, you kind of see that little silhouette, almost, of the character. And then off in the distance, there's that castle town. And you can see all of the whole thing right on that front cover. And then at the top, above everything else, like in the sky, as it were, is the name of the book and the author's name. So I think it, it's a little cluttered, but not at the same time. Like It, it makes really good use of uh, the actual image itself and just having everything zoomed out. Yeah, that's definitely a very good cover. Mm. And there's definitely Curious. some other ones that... Uh, uh, I'm not familiar with, of course, but just like have that one image, as it were, and it's really small, and then the title is really big, and then there's kind of almost empty space, but really good contrasting colors as well. Okay. Yeah. And uh, the third one there is uh, making it clever if it's nonfiction, or emotional if it's fiction. So. Uh, what the article kind of mentioned in it uh, for making it clever, as it were. Um, mm -hmm. Say if you're talking about, uh, I think, what their example was, uh, using a Rubik's Cube just as that focal image. And okay. uh, it was about... Um, I'm not sure what the book was about here. I'm just looking at it right now. I can't even tell, just even from the blurb on there. <laughs> but yeah, it just has a Rubik's Cube, and then like uh, in the Rubik's Cube is an image of the Earth there. So kind of a, makes you think, almost. Hmm. So I think that's what they're trying to get at when you make it clever, like try and make people think with yeah. the cover. And I can almost imagine that kind of spills over into your choice of title maybe as well, a little bit. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it can help to <laughs> have the title work together with the cover image to be something clever or some play on words or. Hmm. Even just like looking at, say, financial books, like, uh, they definitely would make use of a good title to kind of also draw you in, but then, like, there's that image of uh, money or uh, something like that to draw you in as it were with that okay and uh as far as making making it emotional like um they use the image of uh like eyes on there so like a person's eyes you know the window to the soul as it were mm. and just having that one eye on there definitely uh it kind of uh, brings something in there that you wouldn't really be able to get, say, even if you put the whole face of a person on there. Mm. Personally, on my end, I don't really like uh, covers that just have somebody's face on there. I don't know about you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Look, eyes are pretty interesting, I think, when you meet a new person for the first time. I think you, you're always drawn first to the eyes. That's how you connect so I think, yeah, having an eye on the cover or you know, something around that, very interesting. Having it a face, it starts to become a bit like a <laughs> a, a profile picture or something. Yes. Yeah. I'm not sure it works as well, but, you know. And sometimes you get the whole uh, stock image type <laughs> feel to it. Mm. And, uh, yeah, so the next one there that they say is uh, to use either a subtitle or a teaser or a tagline, say, or from a review even. Um, okay. And definitely you see this a lot with uh, those bigger name books, like they'll have uh, even quotes, say, from other authors. Like I, I don't remember exactly uh, what it was, but I remember seeing uh, that the front of this one book had a quote from Stephen King on it. Oh, so yeah. <laughs> imagine what an honor. Yeah. But uh, so I know on the cover <laughs> Yeah. Oh I thought actually on the cover of one of the books there was also a Stephanie Meyer quote. 
but the book that I thought it was, City of Bones, I see now that it's not. Okay. But, yeah, there's there's definitely one with Stephanie Meyer quoting on it as well. Yeah. <laughs> Having kind of that name power definitely uh, would help mm. out. And it kind of, again, it goes back to that uh, social proof side of things that we uh, keep mm. mentioning back, just... Showing that, you know, other people like this book too. <laughs> you exactly. might as well. And, uh, <laughs> even having that bigger name to it as well. Um, mm. on the self publishing side of things, definitely you, you probably wouldn't be able to get someone like Stephen King or Stephanie Meyer to, uh, put their name on your book there. And, uh, you definitely don't want to take a random review, uh, say that you got on Amazon, say from, somebody named Amazon customer or dragon lover 99 or something like that. <laughs> so mm, yeah. you probably want to look for uh, an editorial review uh, to put on there yeah. or even yeah, from well, another look, self-published if... author that could work. Mm, exactly. Um, and if like, you know, a couple of episodes ago we spoke of the lies of Locke Lamora, mm-hmm. um, you know, Scott Lynch got George Martin, to um, <laughs> have a quote on the cover of his book saying "fresh, original, and engrossing." That's pretty. I imagine cool. having, yeah, imagine having someone like George Martin say that about your book. How awesome! Yeah. <laughs> and I mean, you so, could even kind of use that. Uh, like, of course, again, we wouldn't be able to, but uh, he could probably <laughs> even use that on a social side of things, like you know, hashtag at George R. R. Martin or something like that. And mm. kind of ride that sort of thing, and people seeing uh, people looking for George R. George R. R. Martin stuff might even uh, somehow get to his book from mm. that. Yeah, well, if you're inventive, I think there's a lot of things like that you can do without, you know, going into the sleazy side of things. Just you know, be honest about it. If, if he did say that about the book, then that's fantastic. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of uh, advantage to get from that. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> and yeah, just moving on there uh, to the next one. This one's pretty obvious. Um, uh, basically, just picking the right font or uh, picking the right effects kind of to use in the background. And uh, it can be an obvious choice there, but it can be pretty hard actually to get the right looking font and color for the tone uh, that you want because you want to mm-hmm. make sure that it's legible and that it also pops because you don't want it to be kind of fading into the background, I guess, unless that's the effect that you want to get. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. For this one specifically, I would say this, I think, is where the having a professional really helps. Mm hmm. Because, um, you know, even if you, you're kind of visually orient- oriented, uh, it's so easy to get the fonts to clash or to put some sort of glow effect on the font or yeah. some sort of shadow. People always tell you, don't put glow, don't put shadow, <laughs> don't put all sorts of weird things on your fonts. Just keep it simple. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And uh, the next one there, number six, uh, make it personal but not cheesy. Uh, and kind of what we were saying before there, humans are drawn to images and they're drawn to also faces. And uh, if it's used correctly, it can definitely do very well on covers. Um, again, uh, I personally don't usually like covers which just have that person's face uh, because it really doesn't tell anything about the book. <laughs> So uh, if you want to, you can stylize it and say if the book's about vampires, you could have uh, just fangs, like someone with like an open mouth and fangs. Mm. Um, Another thing that a lot of covers do there is having uh, almost like a silhouette, like the Gardens of the Moon there, uh, having Mm. the character with their back facing the camera as it were and Mm kind of almost really small uh, on the page and then there's this big scene in the background so that can be used very effectively Mm. I think there might Jack Reacher I think does a lot of that (laughs) maybe 
I'd have to look it up now. Jack Reacher covers. <laughs> I'm just thinking about that. No, I'm only getting the uh, <laughs> the Tom Cruise movie. Only the series, no. Yeah, that's... Ah, <laughs> uh, yeah, that's not going to work. Oh, yeah, no. Yeah. yeah. I do. I see a couple of them there. He's, it looks like there's a lot of him hitchhiking. <laughs> yeah, I think that's goes directly to the character, probably. <laughs> but yeah, lots of lots of silhouettes of him hitchhiking and on the side of the road and stuff like that. So, uh, okay. you know, learning from the the greats is also a good way to go. So if uh, Lee Child <laughs> is doing good on uh, the Jack Reacher series, there. It, Doing good covers there. Definitely good to yeah. follow. Take notice. See what yeah. you can use. <laughs> so what do you think about the uh, face side of things? Do you like or not like? Or Yeah, I like I said, I, I would like it more if it zoomed in on some aspect of the face. But mm-hmm. More interesting, you know, as you said. Uh, vampire fangs could be a nice subsection of the face to show, which makes it interesting and tells you something. Yeah, where having just a regular face, I'm not sure. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> if it has to show the whole face, I'd rather it show the whole body and maybe show off something about the person. Then maybe he's dressed like an assassin, or maybe she's dressed like a, you know, a governess in a period drama or something. Yeah. So at least then that gives you a clue of the story. But a plain face, yeah, maybe not. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, the next one there, number seven. Uh, kind of the same thing that seems really uh, almost obvious there. Uh, they say if it go if it's too hard to go simple, and mm-hmm. there's lots of ones that uh, really use that effectively. And the example that they gave that I definitely agree with is the new uh, covers for the Song of Ice and Fire, the Game of Thrones. Oh yeah, and it's definitely like almost. Uh, a minimalist design, but it's very eye-catching, and it still mm-hmm. does tell you a bit about the series, at least for the few of them there. So, yeah. like, say, Game I think of those Thrones. those are the covers... Yeah, those are the ones that have, like, the one central thing on kind of a background that fades away. Yeah. So it's so like, like amulet on the one or whatever. Yeah, like on Game of Thrones, they have the picture there. Uh, it's a blue background, and... Uh, it almost kind of looks like a stone wall, as it were, but it's blue instead. And uh, in the middle, between the mm. author's name and between the title, is a medieval sword. And mm. it kind of it uh, contrasts really well. Uh, you'll see that sword first, which would bring to mind that medieval, maybe fantasy feel to it. And then afterwards, mm-hmm. you'll go kind of to the the name of the book and the name of uh, the author. And it does make it really intriguing. So it's like, what is the Game of Thrones? Why is <laughs> it a game? What throne? You know, that sort of thing brings up those questions. And like, is this fantasy? Is this medieval? Is it both? And you really get a lot, even just from that minimalist design, I feel. Hmm. Yeah, that's a pretty good cover. Sure. And I think yours almost kind of is a very similar way. Like, it just has that, <clears throat> that pendant on the front, mm-hmm. right? I think, yeah, I think I kind of took that... Uh, obviously, I didn't look at Game of Thrones specifically, but I, I took that style of cover and I just said, you know, I want something like that. <laughs> yeah. Is that yeah. what you uh, put in there when you were uh, talking with the artists? Or... Uh, yeah, actually, we'll come to this a bit later, I think, <laughs> when we're gonna chat about this. But yeah, it was it was similar to that. I um, yeah, I'll, I'll get to that in a bit. <laughs> <laughs> we'll just uh, quickly go over that uh, last one there. So, the last mm-hmm. one is uh, just about text placement. Uh, you mm-hmm. don't necessarily even need to do like the classic like author's name on top and then uh, name of the book on the bottom. You can kind of change it up, um, put put it up in the corner even, and then have a really big image. Uh, you can mm. also make certain words that 
aren't uh, aren't as necessary a lot smaller so like they brought example of uh, the help uh, with the new cover or I think it might have even been from the movie uh, mm-hmm. but yeah they usually change around the cover to the book as well to kind of match but they had the word the kind of right in the middle of mm-hmm. help so it just kind of worked with the way that the letters were shaped and everything as well. Yeah, so. that's a f- fortunate word that they could fit in there. Yeah. But uh, you get some people that can do wonderful things with typography and how they arrange your cover. Uh, well, your title and subtitle and things. Yeah. I think that's definitely a fantastic skill to have and usually well worth paying for, I think. Yeah. I think the biggest thing is just not to get trapped into one specific style like don't think that you always have to have it on the top and the bottom you know having that little bit of different uh style to it can definitely make it stand out amongst everything else and um even uh further to that you want to make sure that you have a visual consistency if you're doing a uh, series mm, and definitely Kind of one of the things that I was going to get into here as well, um, as I was mentioning with the person who does my covers, uh, originally I got that first one for free because he was looking to kind of expand his portfolio before he started charging. And I did like that initial cover. Like, I, I don't think I would have used it if I didn't like it. But um, <clears throat> when I had the sequel... Uh, there was almost no way to have really a visual consistency across the series mm. at that point with that first cover. And when yeah, he... It would have had to be kind of an identical cover with just another title. Yeah. There was, there was little of it to change. <laughs> yeah. So when I went to him again for the second book, um, he basically made... I ended up using that cover design that he gave me on the first book because it was so good and then I got him to do another one for the second one so uh, it ended up having a really good visual uh, consistency to it after that and he really grew as a designer as well over the period of time between when I released the first one and the second one so his second one was just like again the first one I really liked it but the second time was just he blew me away and yeah i really got that visual consistency down there now so uh definitely in the future i'm going to keep that all the same so uh, anyone who say is familiar with my series if they kind of see it again it might bring to mind those other ones and, and uh it really would look nice on the shelf <laughs> as well yeah no, definitely nice bold colorful i very much like your covers <laughs> So if you uh, wanted to, uh, you can go find Kit Foster, just do a search for his name, or uh, kitfosterdesign.com, so that's K-I-T-F-O-S-T-E-R-D-E-S-I-G-N.com. I'll have the link in the description there as well, and uh, check him out, and he'll definitely give you a good cover, I pretty much guarantee it. (laughs) Fantastic. Uh, you were saying there about uh, how you got your covers? Oh, yeah. Um, I had my cover done through 99designs. I'm not sure whether you've used it before. No, I've but, heard of it. Uh, hmm. It's a nice, it's almost like a like a competition you hold. Mm-hmm. And then uh, you put out the prize money, and then artists kind of compete against one another to submit different designs and they try different things and that's one thing I really like about 99 designs is that uh, as we said before you shouldn't get trapped in one style mm-hmm. you shouldn't think it should always be this way because a book cover can be done in many different ways and the nice thing about 99 designs because you've got 30 to 50 different designs coming in typically you um, you you get to see a lot of different ideas being mixed up and that I think that really helped me to crystallize what I wanted with the cover. Mm-hmm. Um, 
I mean, I must mention there's there's obviously some some drawbacks that people have warned about. So it's good to be aware of this, because of the nature of the site, so many people competing, and so many designs that uh, you know fly <laughs> and get used, and some don't get used. Um, they do warn you that because you get a lot of options to choose from and to refine, but there's always the chance that the design you end up choosing was already used before. Yeah. And it's it's you know, it's usually it's quite difficult to check that because I mean if you get a composited cover, how are you gonna search the world wide web of covers to see whether yeah. <laughs> you know there's another image that's kind of similar to this one? That's gonna be quite difficult. Yeah, but, that's kinda uh, what I was con uh, yeah. I was uh wondering about there, like do you receive almost like they're almost fully done? It's just like put your name here, put the title here type thing, or is it like a rough sketch? Well, no, they're they're mostly pretty much serviceable as they okay. come in, but you do get more rounds. You know, after you choose your top yeah. six or something that you like the most, you get to ask them, please change this, change that, move this word there, change the font. And uh, so, yeah, you get a lot of chance. And that's why I would recommend strongly if you use this service, which I would highly recommend, uh, make sure to, to take the idea that, that you end up choosing just as a baseline and then change it by, mm -hmm. you know, asking the artist, change it, make it your own, make sure that you kind of get it just the way you want. Because if you just take it like that, um, often the the elements in it will already have been used somewhere. Look, I'm sure it's not on purpose, uh, yeah. but I mean, let's be honest. If like if you're a songwriter and you have to put out a new song every week, you can't tell me that after a while some of your songs aren't going to be borrowing from one another. Yeah. It happens. <laughs> life is life. But yeah. uh, the more you, as the author, as the owner of the contest, you know, get in there and ask and change this, modify this. Let's work together. And usually the artists are quite willing to work with you. Uh, the more you change it, the more you're going to make it unique. Yeah, if they're the not, nice thing is, I was just yeah. going to say, if they're not willing to uh, work with you on that, you probably don't want to work with them. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, usually you find the guys that do the best work there are quite experienced as well there, and they will typically work with you very much. And the nice thing is that for follow-up projects, you get to choose that person directly. So you can contract oh. them for a, a project directly. And so that helps when you have a series. And you're going to, I did that exactly with my uh, book for the first one. Um, you know, you pay a couple of hundred dollars. And then for the second one, I had him design it in a way so that I told him, look for the next books. You're just going to be changing the cover. Uh, you're going to be changing the background color and the central image and the title and that's it you're not going to redesign a whole new cover you're just going to change these strategic elements mm -hmm. and that's cool because then the subsequent pro projects are much cheaper uh, yeah. i think i paid one third for the second cover as i did for the first which is pretty awesome oh, you're gonna have to show me that cover now you didn't even th you didn't oh. tell me that <laughs> haven't i told you oh, okay <laughs> i'll okay. show you sometime <laughs> after, after the podcast so. <laughs> mm, okay but yeah, that's uh, it's really good, especially like it gives them a, they're motivated. Uh, to yeah, exactly. They compete against one another, yeah. so it's this free market, you know, <laughs> thing going on. It's quite nice. But yeah, so that's kind of what we've done there. Again, uh, we'll have those links in the description. And uh, audience, why don't you tell us uh, what you think makes a great cover and uh, send us yours if you have a book out there. Uh, let us see your cover, and uh, we'd be we'd be uh, glad to receive those for sure. <laughs> yeah. So uh, thank you once again for joining us here at Second Drafts Podcast. Uh, please be sure to subscribe so you don't miss out on everything you need to write, edit, and publish your way. And let us know what you'd like to see from us in future podcasts. See you next time. Yeah. Cheers, guys. Do you want to support production of this YouTube series? Visit www.patreon.com slash and become a patron today.